Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to go ahead and take a seat right now, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so, welcome. Uh, welcome to this month's uh, lecture uh, on housing discrimination. Uh, I am Ashley Myers. I am the curator of collections here at the Kern County Museum. And tonight we have two speakers, uh, Christopher Livingston and Donato Cruz. Uh, Christopher Livingston has been the director of the Historical Research Center at CSUB for over 10 years, where he has developed uh, collections that document Basque history, housing discrimination, and farm labor movement in California. He teaches courses in archives, special collections, and oral history methods, where he exposes students to the role of diversity and power in shaping archival collections and historical record. He holds a Master of Arts degree in, uh, in History from Cal uh, California State University, Bakersfield, and a Master in Library and Information Science from San Jose State University. Donato Cruz holds a Master of Arts degree in History from California State University, Bakersfield. Along with Chris Livingston, he provides community and student research support and ser uh, services, uh, processes collections, digitizes records, and helps with the yearly gallery exhibit. Donato is a specialist in the history of housing discrimination and redlining. Uh, his current projects include uh, researching housing, urban renewal, suburbanization, and eminent domain for public education. Um, at, before, before I let our speakers go ahead and take over though, um, I would like to invite Dr. Oliver Rosales to give a brief introduction about our speaker's grant work as well as the California Humanities. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to kneel like this. My name is Oliver Rosales. I'm a professor of history at Bakersfield College. Uh, to any high school or secondary students who are in the room, I hope to see you maybe in a few years at Bakersfield College, or heck, if you're even in high school and you want to enroll in college courses, Bakersfield College does that as well. Um, so I'm here, though, in my capacity as board chair for California Humanities, which is the State Humanities Council of California. We have about a three or four million dollar uh, annual budget. And a lot of that money goes out across California to do programs like this. And so, you know, in Bakersfield, we don't have a lot of opportunities necessarily for public humanities. So this is a really cool thing to see, you know, intergenerational folks here, people of all, you know, ages, uh, you know, uh, skin tones, all learning about an important topic that's relevant to our community. So I'm a huge supporter of this work, but also the funder. And for all the young people, I just want to say this. We also fund youth programs, and if there's any teachers in the room, uh, we have a grant line at California Humanities that just rolled out uh, that's focused on uh, kids the ages between like 10 to 16. So if you have any cool ideas of field trips or public humanities projects that you want to do at your school or in your community, reach out to me. I'm happy to give you consultation on that or encourage application. And for the young people, if you're interested in storytelling, media, documentary, we fund a whole line of thousands of dollars every year for youth documentary projects. And you don't have to know how to make a documentary. What you have to know is, here's a story that I want to tell. Maybe it's grandma's story. Maybe it's a story about your church. Maybe it's something that's happening in your community. Um, apply for this stuff. And I'll say, I see grants coming from all across the state, from LA, San Francisco, young people doing this exciting work, I want to see more of it happen in Bakersfield. So again, I applaud you, your teachers, your people for encouraging me to show up. Now, 10 seconds for me to say something about Chris and Donato. They are doing important work. This is important work. You're going to learn something tonight about Bakersfield that you never probably knew before, which is the history of racial segregation in this community, which you might know anecdotally, right? Oh, that's where Mexicans live, or that's where the white folks live, or uh, this is where African Americans live historically. But they're gonna talk about how public policy intersects with the history of racial segregation, not only in this community, but across America. Again, I would argue this is some of the most important work I've ever seen in Bakersfield, and I've been studying this stuff for at least two decades. So having said that, Donato and Chris, I'll turn it over to you. I tend, when I talk, I tend to kind of move around. So um, I usually can project my voice. So once I start moving away from the mic, if you can't hear me, tell me, and I'll be sure that I hover um, over here. Over here. Um, so before, uh, before we begin, I wanted to clarify uh, the aim of this program. Um, 
this tagline here implies support for institutional racism um, in California real estate. And I'm, I bring this up because we had some people uh, approach us about this tagline, and, and we're kind of concerned with, with how, how it was worded. Um, this is not what the, this program is about. Um, as, as you will begin to see, um, and as we will lay out here, in my, my uh, um, so as, as you'll see, uh, what we'll be sharing with you uh, is some of the housing practices that included racist policies which created and sustained housing segregation in Bakersfield. So perhaps this is a better ta uh, tagline here. This project is part of, can everybody hear me out here? Okay, great. Uh, this project is part of, uh, uh, or this talk is part of an overall project, an overreaching project uh, that's titled America's New City, House, Housing Discrimination and Redlining in California Central Valley. And um, um, today we're gonna talk to you specifically about Bakersfield, but this project includes uh, you know, our research, we want to find out um, practices in all the Central Valley. What's going on in Arvin? What's going on in Merced? Um, and, and, you know, curate that collection so people can access it easily. Um, as Ashley mentioned, um, again, my name is Chris Livingston. I uh, hold an MA in History from CSUV uh, and a Master of Library Science uh, uh, with an emphasis in Archival Management from San Jose State University. Uh, and Donato uh, here is also a two-time graduate of, of the CSU. So um, I also just want to reiterate that this pro uh, program is made possible through funding from the California Humanities uh, Program, the Kern County Museum. Thank you, Mike, for hosting us. Um, really appreciate it. And the Historical Research Center at CSU Bakersfield. So what's on today's agenda? Uh, before we get into uh, redlining and uh, redlining practices, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of archives, um, what the HRC is, what the Historical Research Center is, wh who we are, and what we do. And then I'm going to briefly uh, discuss uh, the importance of primary source research to specifically to our research, uh, but to the study of history uh, in general. So um, the HRC, you know, who, who are we, what do we do? Um, so, the Historical Research Center, um, research is in our name, right? Um, we do do a lot of uh, different research on different communities. Um, we were reestablished in 2014, and um, um, that, before we talk about um, you know, how we were reestablished, we need to back up a little bit to 2012 when um, we, uh, the, the CS, CSUB library uh, had a new, a new dean in place. And he approached me at the time I was working at the Kern County Library, and um, he, he said, you know, I, I want to revive this program. Uh, the previous dean didn't believe in collecting archives, uh, so there's, a, there's like a, a dead zone um, in university history in, in our collections. And so um, he said, you know, he, he wanted to resume the, the, the collecting mission and asked if I'd be willing to moonlight a couple hours a week. Uh, it turned out to be like 10 hours a week. Um, we met to discuss to discuss this and discuss the vision. Um, he just he kind of laid out his vision, I laid out my vision, and fortunately, those visions aligned. And um, one of the first things I, I told him is I wanted it to be student-centered. I wanted our archives to be student-centered. And what, what does that mean? Well, if you know anything about archives, you know that it's off, you, you can't just walk into an archive and say, hey, you know, like, like you do a library, just pull a book off a shelf, and you can't do that. There's, there's a lot of uh, protections in place, uh, security protocols, which is all fine, and we do follow those, those types of um, uh, protocols. But um, I remember when I was a student, it, uh, going to archives was really a daunting task. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know who, who to talk to, how to access things, how to interact with the documents. So when I say student-centered, what I mean is we bring our students into our archive and we let them go through the documents. We let them get you know, uh, interactions, they, uh, you know, handle the documents, smell the documents. Um, you know, that sounds a little nerdy, but uh, there's, there's definitely, you just you historians in here, you know, uh, you know what I mean, right? So, um, so why are you student-centered? The other thing, um, 
I wanted to see an expansion in the collecting mission. Typically, university archives collect university history. They usually don't venture into um, the realm of local histories. Um, while I was at the Beale Library, I noticed a lot of missing histories. I, I noticed a lot of uh, very thin histories, you know, that were just kind of glossed over. And my goal was then, and it is still to this day, to bring traditionally marginalized communities into the archive, you know, those histories, bringing those histories into the archive where um, we can start documenting them and uh, you know, doc documenting these histories and uh, study the, studying them in further detail. So how did we do this? Um, well, we had to start off with, you know, the bare minimum, right? We, ha we don't have any archival materials. Well, we have very few, I should say. We're, uh, we were originally in a about a 600 square foot um, room, and uh, so we needed space. So we expanded to about a 4,000 square foot room. We still have the, uh, the, the, the fourth floor archive, and now we have a nice uh, second floor archive. Um, we also wanted to build out our digital uh, ability, so that meant you know purchasing uh, scanners, photography equipment, video equipment. Uh, we have a very robust oral history program, so you know digital uh, voice recorders, things like that. And but now that you have all of this digital data, what do you do with it, right? Where do you put it? So we needed to work with um, not just our campus, but uh, the CSU. Fortunately, the CSU is very supportive of our of, of all CSU missions uh, when it comes to archives and libraries. And so um, we were able to uh, establish a cloud storage uh, infrastructure along with the digital uh, uh, repository for scholarship. So people who are writing histories, um, not just uh, the history discipline, but other disciplines as well. Uh, already mentioned student involvement. We wanted to you know, ramp that up. One of the most popular programs that we have, and I'm kind of, uh, hopefully I can recruit some of uh, your students uh, that are here today over to CSUD. Um, is we have a gallery group. And the gallery group is a group of students who help us research, design, uh, implement, and install uh, museum quality exhibits. You get experience in uh, concise writing, you get to network with people in other disciplines, you get to work with um, other institutions like the Kern County Museum. Um, it's really a great um, experience. In fact, our current exhibit that's coming up, which is based on our research on uh, redlining and housing, um, we had a large group of students contributing to that. Um, of course, we resumed the collecting mission. Um, the other thing that's really important is we were, we were able to embed ourselves into the curriculum. So um, I teach two courses um, in the history department. One is oral history methodology, and the other one is archives and special collections, where students learn not just how to do archival research, but maybe they want to be an archivist. You know, how do we manage archives? Um, learn, knowing how archives are managed is, is really important to conducting research. If you know how they're organized, your, your time's going to be a little bit um, um, you know, spent uh, more wisely in, in researching. And then lastly, there you'll see community outreach, um, where we uh, you know, bring programs such as this uh, to the community but also uh, assisting the community and organizations in archiving their history. So we consult with many groups, um, you know, uh, uh, sometimes we've, we've gone up to the Kern River Valley Museum, sometimes it's a local group uh, that's, uh, you know, maybe an activist group, something like that, uh, and give them advice and guidance on how to organize their collections and make them available for usage. It's very important. So, in essence, we have four components of the Historical Research Center. We have the California Rare Book Room, includes books about Kern County, um, books about California history. Uh, we have uh, the gallery, which I already mentioned. Um, the archives, it's not just local histories. It's also, uh, you know, we have materials that cover political history. We have um, music, religion. We have uh, uh, Civil War letters. We have collections that cover US history and world history. In fact. Our oldest item is from the year 1245. So, um, and then I already mentioned. Uh, Can you smell that one? <laughs> Excuse me. Can you smell that one? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. So um, that's actually a, a, a page out of a book 
on a comment, it's a commentary on the Quran, and it's in Farsi. Um, so, and I already kind of mentioned um, the, um, the courses. Fight me. Um, so let's transition into, into primary sources. And, um, primary sources are, are very important to the study of history. This is where we get our, we don't just make things up, you know, um, as historians. We just, um, we have to see what the sources tell us. Um, we may have an idea of what the history is going to be, but be totally surprised once we get in there and look at the primary sources, right? So, according to the Society of American Archivists, um, how many of you are familiar with primary sources before you came? That's good. I, that, that, makes, that makes me uh, feel good there. Uh, I like that. Uh, a lot of people don't realize what a primary source is. So, um, but according to the Society of American Archivists, it's material that contains first-hand accounts of events and that was created contemporaneous to those events or later recalled by an eyewitness. So that could be like an oral history, right? Um, where we interview somebody uh, who uh, witnessed the 1952 Bakersfield earthquake, right? Um, we can get a, a lot of information out of, out of that. Um, another example is the document to the right. That is an uh, image of a Spanish will from 1641 that we have in our collection. Um, and uh, this is on vellum. So you know, getting back to our student program, we pull this out. And we, t we, we talk to students about what vellum is. They have no idea that it's, it's animal skin, right? So. Um, this, th these are great tools to work with. And Chris, how would you keep animal skin? How would you preserve that in your archives? So for not it's organic material, right? Yeah. So um, eventually, it's going to deteriorate. Um, you're you're, you're going to lose the paper. Is the same, you know, regular uh, pulp paper. Um, you can do things to stave off the uh, deterioration, but eventually you're going to lose it, right? So you do that by controlling your climate, uh, controlling your rel relative humidity putting them in protected boxes, um, limiting um, access, and I'm going to talk about uh, access to uh, archival materials here in a second, but um, that's, that's kind of the strategy you would take. So, um, so uh, the purpose of primary sources are, you know, they are the building blocks of history. They provide us information, uh, you know, whether it's factual or misleading. Um, yeah, there are, there are misleading um, documents uh, found in archives. Um, they offer original thought. They help us understand context of historical events. They uh, aid in supporting arguments and scholarship. Um, I mean, you read a history book, you're going to have, uh, you're going to see references to primary sources, right? Um, and they, but more probably most importantly, though, is they lead to new understandings and new interpretations. Um, as these documents arise, um, we learn, we can learn more from history. Um, I remember a few years ago, it's, it's been several years now, but there was a collection that um, was discovered uh, of letters that uh, brought some new understanding to uh, Franklin Del Delano Roosevelt and uh, some of the relationships that he had with people. Uh, but there are difficulties that are, that are associated with um, primary sources. And one of the first things is finding sources, right? Um, you know, you can have this great idea for a topic, and I mean, if the sources aren't there, you know, you're not really going to go, go go very far. Um, a lot has not been digitized. We're in the Google age, right? We'll just go to Google. Google will tell us, right? We can just go and, and type in a, a search, and uh, something will come back. But I would I would go out on the limb and say that that well, at least in our collections about 90% of what we have has not been digitized. And we have probably three terabytes of information. Seven, seven now, okay, so seven, seven terabytes is a lot of information. But we still probably haven't scratched the surface of what we have. We've, we have thousands of pages, uh, like court records and things like that. Um, so not everything's been digitized. So I, I, you know, often to uh, my students' chagrin, they'll come to me and say, I need this, this primary source. Uh, where can I Google it? And I tell them, well, you're probably going to have to go, you know, up the road to Berkeley, or you're going to have to uh, come over to the Kirkland Museum. Um, it's it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that uh, when you're coming up from the digital age, right? So you got to go in knowing that just not everything's been digitized. Um, they're difficult to access. 
um, you know, sometimes it's it's because of distance, right? You, you, you know, the, the archive you need is uh, maybe across the country or on the other side of the world. Um, the condition of the artifact, so that's, you know, that can restrict your access. Uh, sometimes documents are in such poor condition that um, you're not going to get any access. The best that you might get is a, photo, a photograph of that document. And um, what we know um, with digitization is we lose some items in translation. You know, when we, when we set, uh, digitize a, an item into the digital world. Um, they can be incomplete. Um, so for example, a, a business uh, archive documenting 50 years of history might only have three years of financial information. So you might have missing information uh, there as well. Um, some collections are private. Um, you know, family documents, things like that. But there are also private collectors out there that, um, you know, you know, collect everything from rare books to, uh, you know, actual um, documents and artifacts. There's often language barriers, but probably the most alarming is the costs uh, associated with it and the denial of access. So, uh, costs, for example, most archives will charge reproduction fees. Um, those are usually pretty reasonable, and it's it's you know for the time that they it's, it's, it's spent to digitize the item or you know the staff work uh, to, to get that item for you. Um, but sometimes you'll find archives that, that charge very high prices to get um, materials. And then the denial of access, um, you just never know if you're gonna you know what's gonna happen as as far as uh, whether you're gonna get access or not. Um, sometimes. Um, you know, archives may not, an, a, a, a staff, an archival staff may not know exactly what they have. And that kind of creates a, a, an artificial denial of access. Uh, of access. Uh, but probably a more concrete example would be like with Donato. Um, he, he, when he was uh, doing his research um, in, for his thesis, he went up to the National Archives, or was trying to go up to the National Archives, but he was denied access for two months by the National Archives because of a government shutdown. So, so there's things like that that can happen. So why? I mean, what, what is the importance of discussing primary sources for this presentation? Um, well, all of those barriers I, I told you about, we've encountered them in this, for this research. Um, and I think, you know, it's very easy to just give up and, and not tell the story, right? Um, but some stories are so important that they need to be t told and they need to be pursued. Uh, like the story we're gonna talk, to, talk about tonight uh, is very important. And so we've, we've, we've come, in, uh, come across these barriers and we continue to, to face these barriers. Um, and it's just, it's just a fact of, of this type of research. So before I turn it over to Donato, um, I wanna talk about this newish collection. Uh, this is where it all started in 2015. This research that you're gonna hear today uh, was found in this collection. Um, back in 2015, I got a lead by a former curator from the museum here uh, on uh, a collection that was being housed in, the, um, in a uh, storage facility uh, nearby. And um, so I went out there, started looking through it, and um, I knew it was, it was a real estate collection. Wasn't sure exactly what was gonna be in there. I started opening up boxes and I started seeing you know, some ledgers and things, some more really boring information. Uh, but then I opened up a box and I saw some reference to Sunset Mayflower. And I knew right away from going back to the Beale, um, you know, remember I said that one of the uh, missing histories, you know, there's missing histories going on. Uh, I saw a lot of reference to Sunset Mayflower, but no substance about Sunset Mayflower. So I knew right away that this was a collection that we had to take. And I didn't even look at the rest of the collection so, uh, until I got back to the, to the archives. So we loaded it up and we looked it um, out to uh, CSUB and then I had a graduate student um, um, at the time and I put them on it to process and in about a couple of weeks he came to me and he says, you know what, I think I've got a topic for um, a thesis and, um, it, you know, housing discrimination and um, that, stu that student was, was Donato and um, so he, he rolled with it and turned it into a very, uh, very well-written thesis, um, and that research is kind of carried on, um, you know, here at, uh, over at CSUB and the HRC. And so, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Donato. Where is the sunset? It's uh, generally in Southeast Bakersfield, and, and 
There's two sunsets. There's like Sunset Park and then Sunset Track. So that'd be like Cottonwood, Panama today. So Con, it's uh, Brundage and MLK Boulevard and uh, South King. That's uh, Sunset uh, Track. Sunset Park, I think, is by Oleander. Yeah. Right. Oleander Park by Vanderbilt High School. Yeah. So uh, there's two sunsets. <laughs> Very different sunsets too. Yeah. So uh, let let me uh, get started. So. Uh, I'm going to start with the modern definition of redlining. I know previously uh, with other research, uh, redlining often referred to the Housing uh, Homeowners Loan Corporation maps that were uh, kind of dictating what home value and investment was for banks. And often that meant that um, people of color, people that were minorities lived in those neighborhoods and they were the least likely to be invested in. Um, redlining has now a new definition, and I'm going to read it. Uh, this is from the New York Times, What is Redlining by Candace Jackson. In recent years, the term redlining has become a shorthand for many types of historic-based exclusionary tactics in real estate, from racial steering. Racial steering is when someone tells you, wouldn't you like this neighborhood better? Uh, you know, oh, people speak your language there. Wouldn't you like to live there? And, and that's illegal. Um, by real estate agents uh, directing black home wires, and renters to certain neighborhoods or buildings away from others, uh, to racial covenants, and those I'll talk about uh, in a little bit, in many suburbs and developments bearing uh, black residents from buying homes, all of which contributed to racial segregation to shape the way America looks today. So we are currently operating under the new redlining definition. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the conditions of minorities living here in Bakersfield. And this is from a, a report uh, that was done by the then governor, C.C. Young, in 1930, kind of detailing the lived experiences of Mexican Americans. And in this, you can see um, the top part of the report. They asked uh, 40, 20, wait, 47 uh, cities if they racially segregated Mexican Americans, and 24 of them responded yes. Bakersfield was on that list. And then uh, on the bottom it says, in addition to other board-sided causes inserted in the deeds and cells, the contract is calculated to confine Orientals, Mexicans, and Negroes to certain districts. Although most of these causes stick to restrict, restrict the occupancy of premises to persons of Caucasian race, in some instances, Mexicans was defined specifically and prohibited from occupancy. So this is, uh, they're saying what kind of barriers did uh, minorities face in trying to buy homes. And interesting enough, I learned last night by reading Gene uh, 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 Slater, Gene, uh, um, I think Slater, uh, his book, Freedom to Discriminate, C.C. Young was also a real estate agent, which is interesting enough. So this is the other condition housing. This is uh, talking about conditions of housing in the Mayflower District. And in the top I have the quote, there are no sanitary facilities whatsoever that having to use pit toilets whose stench is readily recognizable miles away. Many Negro citizens of Bakersfield proper against overwhelming odds have been able to buy land and build lovely, comfortable homes and dwellings. So this is just trying to talk about the, uh, the types of experiences that minorities had and buying homes and, and the conditions of housing that they also experience, right? And uh, these photos on here are on the right, uh, are in the museum's collection. Thank you. And uh, so now we're going to talk about federal home loan programs. So we're going to talk about the FHA and the HOC. Uh, who here has studied the New Deal? New Deal programs, right? So these were created under the New Deal to kind of stop the, uh, the foreclosure home process, also to elevate uh, the conditions of housing. In those times, uh, most people often built their own homes or uh, didn't have access to sewer if they didn't live in the city. And uh, most people that face this type of discrimination were people of color. Uh, the FHA and HLC also adopted uh, racially, um, racial, racial clauses to exclude people from buying. Also, they had a certain restrictions to avoid uh, investment in their neighborhoods. So, We'll talk about more about this systemic racism that contributes to the building of America during this time. So uh, with the FHA and HOC, 
And I'll, I'll explain this. So the bottom right here is a color-coded map, and uh, these are often referred to as redlining maps. Red was the fourth grade, the least likely to receive investment, right? And green was the highest, the neighborhoods where real estate agents and banks often invested in. So Bakersfield has been cited multiple times that it does not have a map, and, it, and it's most likely due to the, the small population of the time. But it doesn't mean that it wasn't excluded from the type of grading practices that, a, that the FHA and HOLC did, right? It, there just wasn't a map, but the practice was here, right? So uh, or here on the right, it's hard to see, but that's a valuation map from uh, the Hillcrest neighborhood where they're uh, judging things like, is there a school near your home? Is there a shopping mall near your home? Do you have the sewer? Uh, and it says things are very positive, especially if they're supporting the investment of it, like um, surrounded by uh, hospitals and things, things that often was not available to uh, black and brown communities because of the lack of urban investment. So uh, this type of grading practice is, is um, part of the grading, even though we don't have the map, the practice is here. So now we get into racially restricted covenants, right? So the FHA in 1938, in their underwriting manual, their underwriting manual is something that they taught real estate agents uh, how to buy, how to sell, how to treat their buyers. In that, in section, um, section G, it says prohibition of the occupancy of properties except by the race of which they are intended. And this underwriting manual was also used as a template and it taught real estate agents to kind of use this template language. And very often that language is very, very uh, similar to the unwrite, underwriting manual. And they use this um, through and through. And we see large examples used in Bakersfield. I'll show you the map of what we base this language on. So uh, Article 3 on the bottom, it says, no part of property shall be used or occup occupied or permitted to be occupied by any race not of the white or Caucasian race except for such persons are in, that are engaged in bona fide domestic employment of the owner thereof or holdings under said owner. So this is actually language from a neighborhood here in Bakersfield. And this is often how they excluded uh, people who weren't white to, buy, to not buy in those neighborhoods, right? So, and this is, we can see that uh, real estate agents here in Bakersfield are adopting the underwriting manual's um, suggestions. So prior to 1938, so there's a period um, between 1938 and 1950 where the FHA sponsors that language and they say that, you know, they're recommending use of racially restricted language uh, for their home loan process, right? And then uh, I'll kind of get after what happens after 1948, 1950, but before that, before they recommended the use of race restrictions, uh, real estate agents also took it upon themselves to use that language outside of the recommendation of the FHA. So prior to 1938, we have this article in 1909 where uh, Bakersfield Realty Building Company is organized and they also support um, raci racial restrictions. So we have here, um, it says, all the lots will be restricted to not less than $1,000 dwellings, as well as to members of the Caucasian race. So we can see this practice is also before FHA. Uh, historians have now been uh, diving into the National Association of Real Estate Boards, the California Real Estate Association, and seeing what kind of influence they had on real estate agents before FHA and HOLC. And now uh, there's been other uh, historians like Paige Glosser who has seen that uh, those were actually the boards who were consulted when they were building the FHA to bring on that influence, right? So uh, this is not necessarily unique to Bakersfield, not unique to uh, what we think of like uh, the urban north or even um, the Midwest. And so th these are some of the practices that are, that are kind of happening around the nation even before the FHA starts. It's not really necessarily unique to the FHA now is what the analysis is. So, uh, and there I don't have the exact quote, but uh, that's a grant deed from 1924 in Bakersfield where it also has that racially exclusive language. And interestingly enough, this is uh, someone who's selling property to the city of Bakersfield, who is also including race restrictions. So the role of the real estate agent and realtors, which is uh, interesting enough also, I learned recently that the word realtor was uh, coined in a, in a way to step away from bad reputation that real estate agents had 
and especially in the predatory practices and and often uh, described as uh, predatory or abusive. So they coined this term realtor, but the way they, they reimagined the real estate agent was by using these code of ethics, right? They said that a realtor follows these codes of ethics. They follow, uh, you know, a policy. They, they, off, they often follow recommendations, right? And they're not abusive, right? But in these code of ethics, we also have very suggestive language of race relations, right? So is, is it truly code of ethics is what I ask. So this is uh, 1950, uh, the code of ethics for the California Real Estate Association. A realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property of which is clearly detrimental to the property values of the neighborhood. So I could see where they would, you know, discourage people from living there. Oh, and by discourage, I mean moving on to a different neighborhood, right? Not selling you there. Um, and this is the Code of Ethics for the National Association of Real Estate Boards, Article 34. Uh, and I believe that's like 19, 1924. I, a realtor shall never be instrumental in introducing a neighborhood, a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or individuals whose presence will be clearly detrimental to the property values of that neighborhood. So uh, again, this is um, before the FHA. Well, at least for the Code of Ethics for the National Association of the Real Estate Boards. Question? So the implication that they're making is that if people of color move into these neighborhoods, then property values will go down. Yeah, so that is often an argument that they use. Um, I, I think once, they, once you hit to the 60s, uh, you get a lot of uh, politicians backing up the opposite, right? There's data to say that that, that is clearly not the truth, right? And it's, I've seen more of it in the, uh, with the Rumford Fair Housing Act in 1963, in 1964, especially with the overturning of Prop 14. There's more of the arguments to show that um, that, that is not the fact, right? But um, if, uh, I would recommend Freedom to Discriminate by uh, Gene Slater. Uh, he's, um, he talks about a lot of those arguments and how they're, they're kind of core to the, the beginning uh, recommendations for race restrictions, right? That they're, they're really using the investment language, right? And how that kind of tacks on to later forms of policy. So this is the racially restricted map uh, from Bakersfield from 1938 to 1950. This is about a 12 year period. Uh, we can see how much, how many neighborhoods are also built during that period. And, um, some of them are older, some are what they call uh, re-subdivisions, is where they go and they uh, reinvest in an older neighborhood that was already established. But this is just Bakersfield. Um, for all of Kern County, we found about 171 in a, in a, in a 12 year period. That's, that's very expansive. There's a covenants in uh, McFarland, Delano, Shafter, Wasco, Tehachapi, um, as far as uh, China Lake. Um, so, but this is just Bakersfield. And I actually have the arrow. Um, uh, who here knows that George Bush lived in Bakersfield briefly? Yeah, so uh, that arrow was his neighborhood. It was a racially restricted neighborhood. For white people? Yes. So uh, it, I was, it's interesting enough. And then, um, yes? Actually, two presidents lived in that house. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, his father, yeah. I was like, which one? <laughs> the both, both Bushes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, based on a modern map. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Here, okay, so this is a 99. This is a uh, Highway 58, so you see the major highways. This part is where the uh, Mayflower uh, neighborhood is. Sunset's right over here. So um, this is uh, where Bakersfield College is, so you can kind of identify the east side. This is where um, East Bakersfield is, around this area. This is where the Kern County, uh, J the KMC is now in the hospital. Uh, this is Westchester. Uh, this is uh, kind of the intersection of Oak and and uh, Brundage right here. So uh, this is Holby Park. Uh, Oleander is right around this area. This is uh, Oleander Terrace, I believe, yeah. around this area. Can you uh, show where Lamont is? Lamont. Uh, this is a big map. So Lamont is right down there. It'd be down south, yeah, so. What's the um, cross street of the, today's cross street of the flower <coughs> area? The 58 and, right? yeah. oh yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. And the park? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so the park's right here. Oh, okay. So if you see, it's right, right under over. 
So I think this is South Team. Uh, I believe this is Brundage. This is uh, Mark King Boulevard. Uh, I'm not sure which one of the guys. I'm not too familiar with Virginia. Virginia, I think so, yeah. So it's Virginia. So this is close to, uh, is it, um, what's the school there? Is it? Bessie Owens? Bessie Owens, yeah. Bessie Owens is right here. So the cemetery, I believe, is right around this area. I can point any other landmark, not landmarks, if you like. Yeah, no, that was, good. That was, okay. That was, yeah. We were trying to figure out where they kind of live in comparison to this. So. I, I think if they're, uh, is it Delaro, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's. Uh, they're it's further south. south. They're further south. That's yeah. right, Panama yeah. and, and okay, so right there. Yeah. So, I so think there was like, a covenant there. It's red. It's yeah. Red. Yeah. Forty-one and fifty. We we do have. If, if you saw the flyers in the back, there's QR codes. And on our on our website, we do have like an interactive map where people can look up their address. Yeah, so I, I, I whenever I'm around, I'll be like, oh, like I wonder if this neighborhood, and sometimes I'm surprised. Like I was in Lamont the other day, and Lamont's demographic has changed significantly, but the, at the, by the park, there was a lot of restrictive covenants. So uh, what really changes and what really doesn't change, so, what changes the shift of using racially exclusive language in these contracts is Shelley versus Kramer, which was a Supreme Court case in 1948. And all this court said, this court case said was that you couldn't take uh, these contracts to court to enforce them. It doesn't mean it didn't mean that you couldn't racially segregate, that you couldn't, uh, you know, racially steer. It didn't. It didn't even say you couldn't enforce it. Technically, you just couldn't take it to a court. Right, so what happens is in 1950, the FHA says, we'll no longer finance loan, uh, loans on homes that have racially exclusive language. So that doesn't mean that it stops the practice. What happens is we, we stop the, the use of the language, so it's harder to map at this point. But that's why we have that 12-year period where we can map it, because for that 12-year period, that language was universal for a lot, of, a lot of homes that were brand new, a lot of homes that had the most investment. So uh, that's, that's what makes it difficult after 1950, but after talking uh, to some other people that are doing similar research, it sounds like other places continue to use it, right? It wasn't dropped uniformly across the board, just Bakersfield uses, uses that to stop using the language. But like I said, it doesn't mean that the practice stopped, right? So the question is, with, with all this practice, so how did uh, racial minorities buy? So it, they bought through this process called buying on contract where most often uh, the real estate agent owned the property. They were the broker, the owner, and they, they pretty much set the rules and everything, right? So this is a contract uh, for John Wilborn, who uh, started the uh, St. John's uh, Missionary Baptist. He was the, uh, the first pastor and builder of the church, uh, and he actually bought on contract. He bought the original uh, church property on contract as well. We, uh, we worked with his uh, grandson, and we were able to identify him. We actually got to see those documents, and he got to share a lot of his, uh, his family history with us as well. But, um, but the problem with this, you're like, well, they could get homes, right? It was certain neighborhoods, and also it was very predatory, right? Uh, the real estate agent, uh, this is from the Claude Logic Collection, he wouldn't take it to the Hall of Records and register it for public record until you had paid about 50%. So if you failed before that, there was really no protections, right? Because he never went to the public record, never submitted it. So that created a long range of abuses where he dictated the control for a very um, long amount of time. And uh, most often, that was the down payment, right? So once he cleared the down payment, then he would take it to the Hall of Records. So, but if he didn't clear it, then he just kept reselling the home and reselling the home and reselling the home and reselling the home and reselling the home, right? I mean, there's, you look at these and they're like packets of the same home being resold sometimes every year, sometimes more often, right? And in my research, I've also seen whenever the city annexed that area into city boundaries, uh, whenever they installed the sewer, that also led uh, to losing of many homes because they were bonded into debt uh, by the city, right? So this real estate agent, the same one, Claude Blodgett, he went and he would go buy it from the county or the city whenever they took over and they had defaulted on their taxes. So he, he, there was other ways for him to get the property back. It wasn't just through him, it was also through defaulting of taxes. And there was, I have like a statistic, like in 1956, like of one month, he bought like 16 homes back, which is astronomical if you think of like one month in one year, that was a lot. 
So, and now we get into uh, what does urban investment look like in this time, right? So now we have this map of racial exclusion. We're kind of getting the sense of what uh, real estate practices look in this time period, right? So Bakersfield has an earthquake in 1952, which kind of makes it unique, not, you know, not in a tragic way, but in a, they get to reinvent their city, right? They get to reinvest money. So many places, when they took the opportunity to leave their downtowns, uh, who here goes to some towns, you're like, wow, they have a beautiful historic district. Why doesn't downtown have one? Because Bakersfield reinvented their city and they reinvented the platform, the market platform as America's new city at the time. And this is what really creates the driving force, the economic driving force in the 50s for Bakersfield and its recreation, its brand new buildings, its brand new schools. It really transforms Bakersfield. They, they invest millions of dollars. Uh, but the question is, when I look at these, uh, you know, tourist maps, uh, where are the communities of color? And they're behind this logo. This is where Mayflower is sunset. They're, they're, they're not like with it Was it annexed at the time or not? Yes, uh, it was uh, December of 1950, I believe. Uh, yeah, so it's after the annexation. Yeah, so uh, you can see the palm trees, the mobile stations, it's not in those communities, right? So we can see that the investment is not in the, in the communities. So that must be Union in California right there? Yes. <laughs> this is unique. You can see the old Bakersfield sign yeah, in California yeah, right here. Yeah. Wow, they're just totally not there. Yeah. Wow. So one of the things I look at for tourist history is is what communities are excluded. Yeah. So and then that's what that's hence the uh, program name, America's New City, right? And, and how does how does urban investment exclude these people as well? So and, and we have like ads like this: Bakersfield, the comfortable place to live. And by then, Bakersfield College has opened on the east side, right? So that, that's part of that investment. Bakersfield College had its shared interest in relocating after outgrowing their original location uh, in Kern Union High School. They moved to East Bakersfield because East Bakersfield is one of the, the highest investment areas at that time. So we can see some of these original advertisements of that time period. They rebuilt churches. They rebuilt the courthouse. They, they rebuilt you know, a lot of public buildings. They move the college, so that kind of shifts investment to what I call the new East Side, the new East Bakersfield, right? And East Bakersfield is transformed, and you know, in modern times, Bakersfield, East Bakersfield is also transformed to a different context, right? So the the, the, the history is also transforming. But these are some of those advertisements, and this is a uh, reflection about ten years later, uh, talking about the earthquake, and this is the the mayor at the time. Uh, during the earthquake, uh, by then I believe he had retired. He's giving some commentary, and he says, "What we had was an urban renewal uh, by the act of God." And one of the things I question is, you know, how much is this uh, something that they make decisions on? How much uh, does this policy uh, a reflection of of decisions, right, an artificial thing, right? And how much they dictate investment to certain neighborhoods? Uh, what kind of stores get put everywhere, right? So I, I question some of those. Um, you know, driving forces as well. But it's interesting that you know, he's reflecting on the back uh, 10 years later of how much the city has grown. By 1962, uh, there's a, like a, a large tourism industry, and I'll have a list of like how much gets uh, renovated. But in our own archives, uh, we have some Kern County core records where we have like the blueprint mapping of uh, Lake Ning, which was built during that time, uh, of Lake Isabella, which was turned into a rec recreational lake at that time. Right, we can see these large public urban investments. So this is some of the some of the lists, and it, it, I, I called it a small list. It looks kind of large, but there's way more that I didn't miss. So they built City Hall, Mercy Hospital, St. St. Paul's Episcopal, uh, First Christian, First Congregational, St. Joseph's Church, St. Uh, Pleasant View Baptist, uh, the Core Building, Jail and Garage, the Library. Uh, the Arvin Auditorium, Tachigal uh, Veterans uh, Memorial Building, the Taft Library, Bakersfield Veterans Memorial Building, Stony Brook Retreat, Arvin High, Kern Union High School, uh, Bakersfield City uh, Schools, a lot of the schools were rebuilt, and then uh, Lake Ming and Lake Isabella, and uh, this is also a reflection from an advertisement. Uh, the street scene is modern, right? So this is how expansive the urban investment of after 1952 is. It really takes them about 10 years to reimagine and rebuild the city. Uh, the, the county is also rebranded as the land of magic, right? So playing off those things where it's somewhere where they attract tourism, jobs, and investment. So the question is, how were homes affected? So um, one of the things that we, we are really crucially missing is 
is what kind of investment the city and the county took to rebuild homes. And this is also from the Kern County Museum shout out. Um, this is, and interesting enough, the caption said this is a Negro home, and I haven't really found out much, except that that must have been Frank Sullivan and some of his, um, some of his, uh, uh, like, entourage, because the photo is photographed in many newspapers. So I, I haven't really found much, but I know that this, this house was covered vastly. And with every newspaper, they came and took photos that day. But I have found very little. But what I could, what I could speculate is that um, this home was in Mayflower. So uh, Mayflower, in the 1940s, a real estate agent, uh, Elmer Carpey, uh, built new homes there, but wrote a racially restrictive covenant in the opposite way. It said only black residents. So, uh, and he's credited as building new homes for uh, black residents in Bakersfield. So I'm assuming that if the caption is the caption and that they were following, this was most likely in a flower, right? Renato, yes. Do you know, like, looking at that picture, is there any evidence to suggest if these houses were, like, adequately built? Like, so, like, were they just, like, you know what I mean? Like, were they, because they were built so the, the covenant areas, the covenant areas, I was told that they were built, like, you know, like at least the research and the housing and everything shows that they were pretty much modern, right? But if you want to look at a stark photo from the same era. Were they like, 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 like they were just like, and eh, just built like, yeah. NBA. You know, like, I mean, like a, like a Ferris wheel from the fair compared to like Disneyland Ferris Yeah. So, so you see those photos of those of homes? That's from the same time period. They're, they're just not on that block. So that block was supposed to be the, you know, when people said, well, I want new homes, I want to live in a place where they're investing. And they said, no, but you can have your own suburban, like kind of, but in the segregated neighborhood, right? So from, from what I understood is that those, those homes that were built uh, with the covenant were built up to like suburban standard, but your neighbors, those are from the same neighborhood. This is, this is I believe this is, says, uh, the, I think it says Cottonwood is with the geographic area, so it's not that far from there. It's actually maybe like three or four blocks from, from those homes, so you kind of see the, the, the stark reality between what you think of suburban neighborhoods, where all your neighbors look the same, uh, in housing, right, uh, you know, similar investments, similar uh, color of housing and everything. Um, in, in Mayflower, we only have like one block, right, and then every other house uh, looks like this, and then we, we kind of see what happens after, after with the War on Poverty programs, when they're in the 19, uh, late 1960s, uh, 70s, when they're trying to uplift the neighborhoods and reinvest as well. We're getting a lot of these types of photographs. So there's like a, there's more of an analysis, but there's like a, this interesting thing happening in that neighborhood, but also from a very segregated standpoint. So there is restorative justice. So there has been an assembly bill, I believe uh, within the last recent years, I think it's 2021, assembly bill 1446, which if you find out if you live in one of these neighborhoods, you can actually uh, do paperwork and get that racially restricted language removed. So, um, yeah, and this is a uh, law in California. There's one in Oregon. Uh, similar, a lot of states are adopting these um, kind of uniformly. Um, and the uh, Kern County Hall of Records has a process where you can contact them and um, remove this language. So if you think you live in a neighborhood and you look at the maps, I've done a lot of research. I can I can just give you the document and be like, hey, this is the restrictive covenant, and you can start your own process. But I'd be glad to help you out. Yeah, oh, question. Yes. Do you have to live in that neighborhood to have the neighborhood? Uh, I so I was told that uh, some counties are proactively removing everything. So like, um, is it Marin County? Marin County? They they've taken the um, the initiative of doing that themselves. Right, so some counties have done it themselves. Most require, uh, so I think there's different interpretations of that law. Um, uh, we got contacted by a researcher once and we're like, every county is, re is removing this language and that's just not the fact, right? So I think uh, if you initiate it yourself, you're, you can get that language removed. Uh, some places like uh, Marin County is, has practically done that for themselves. So I, I think uh, there isn't a uniform practice about that. Yes? No, they, they weren't be honored, but they they are still there. Okay. If that makes if you go to the Hall of Records and say, hey, can I get this? 
track restriction, it would still be there, right? So uh, I think in recent times, uh, there's been people who have been going through the home buying process and have seen that in their contracts. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what, it, what it would look like in Bakersfield if they, they automatically remove those, but they are technically still in a place where you can access it for legal use, which is the Hall of Records, right? Like a birth certificate, a death certificate. So they still hold that power, if that makes sense. Even if there's laws, uh, you know, 1968, the Fair Housing Act, and things like that prohibit the use of these explicitly, but um, they're, it, they're kind of on there. They're kind of figurative in that sense, right? They hold power in that sense. So. I, I think that's what the, the motivations are, is that if someone's buying a home and that these legacy documents aren't, aren't just kind of in there, right? So, uh, and also interesting enough, the uh, California Association of Realtors uh, recently apologized for their role in uh, discriminatory housing practices. And this was more related to their role in overturning the Run for Fair Housing Act. But since uh, they don't really, ex they don't really ex explain the history of their role, they mostly just say we're sorry, right? So I, I think that's where we have the need for these types of public forums. Where we talk about the history and, and kind of the complexities of it. I think we've asked some really good questions that kind of show that some of these neighborhoods are very complicated, right? Especially how they're developing, what kind of the investment looks like, and, and what do their neighbors look like as well. So I, I, I think that in, in apologizing moves things forward, but doesn't really answer everything since they didn't do an expansive role of their history. Notice it also says for past discrimination. Yes. It does not acknowledge at all that these practices still continue in some places, right? Yes. I mean, yeah, so it's, uh, they, I think it was more of a rubber stamp, right? Yeah. They're like, we're good. Exactly. Yeah, so I, I think that was part of not actually going and diving into the history in a very complete way, right? And, and I think it's a, it's a very intentional move. So uh, we're also gonna have a, a upcoming programming on November 3rd uh, in the CCB uh, Humanities Building uh, 1109, Friday from 1 to 2.30, and um, we'll be giving a similar presentation. And then we'll, we also invite you to our gallery. Um, uh, I think we're still on board for October 20th to, to get everything going, so. Um, let's see what else. So we'd like to thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes. I was uh, surprised to read in the uh, Bakersfield, California, that Stockdale Country Club in the 40s, 50s, 30s was the only golf country club in the county kind of a thing. So a number of very prominent business people in town had applied for membership and were denied. They were Jewish, Greek, Italian, and Croatian. So they started Bakersfield Country Club in protest. I didn't know there was, I, I mean, we all know the common targets of discrimination in that time period, but I'm surprised there was a secondary discrimination against certain ethnic groups. I, I was just really naive and didn't know that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll comment that. Uh, some of the restrictive covenants that we hope to print, some of them actually have blood purity, like, examples. And in my assumptions, they probably use it for people that, um, you know, they, they wanted to exclude, like, ethnic whites as well. Um, so I, I think there's further research to see how those blood purity ones examples were being used. Uh, they're not very common, but I thought they're really interesting. I was like, well, why would they go with, you know, 100% Caucasian, like in blood, right? So I, I think that's what they were after was excluding additional, uh, like other people as well. Other questions? Can, can I comment on that too? Like, yeah, of course, like, uh, yeah. Peter, Peter LaChapelle, right, mm -hmm. who was, was from Bakersfield, he's at Nevada. His book, Proud to be an Okie, looks at that sort of white on white discrimination and it's it's really kind of a legacy of the eugenics movement so it's i imagine that's what you're you're hearing there and that yeah. example that was just uh, i guess i was just naive you know because you just think of your common targets of sure. folks and um, i remember uh friends moved here and the guy was a dentist but he was chinese and he, he couldn't get any patients at all for like a year. There were nobody, could, they'd walk in, see he was Asian, they'd walk out. Yeah. And that was in like 1954, and I, I was shocked about hearing that story. Yeah. Now, um, I'm curious about, is there any, did you talk about the re, kind of, uh, invention, if that's the proper word, it's, it's been a long day, of downtown, and how kind of, downtown after the earth, the Chinatown, of downtown disappeared after the earthquake. Is there any 
kind of archival, you know, archive so, documents. So I think the both. Yeah. What happened to that? So I, I have one article citation I ever found, and it was in uh, the uh, Beale Memorial Library in the vertical file, and that's where I got a lot of this information from, uh, that it said that they, they took the opportunity to remove uh, eyesore areas, and that it was like brush on the rug kind of deal. Like one citation, never mention it again, and, and Chinatown disappears. I think uh, the PC Museum, you have probably the, the best Chinese collection. I'm yeah, not sure what the, what the breadth is. World but, renowned. Yeah. Um, we actually had a group of researchers coming up from Berkeley, and they were here a week in residence digitizing our documents. There were two Chinatowns, one just on one side of Chester, and then one further down toward Union. And, and at that time, that's where you had your gambling and the tenderloin. There were pros was prostitution, illegal uh, alcohol places when alcohol was illegal. So after the earthquake, they used that as an opportunity to get rid of what they called the cribs, the gambling dens, and all that. And they kind of wiped that area out and rebuilt it. But I, I remember going to one building that was down near now where the Larry Ryder Center is, and there are all these little tiny bricked over windows. It was a crib. It was a house of prostitution. And it was right behind. It's right there where the Larry Ryder Center is now downtown. And then I, I don't know, Irene, do you have any comment about them wiping the Chinatown out? No, I, I came here in 1958. Okay. That was gone. It's gone. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I have a question to kind of piggyback. Well, first of all, I'm going to go over a student. I'm a junior. My name is Jalen Hendricks. I'm here for the year. Um, I kind of want to piggyback off of what Garrison said about what's being done in our communities now to kind of figure out where our investment is going in there. Now, from a future generation, you can see, I don't plan the same way as you like, you want to put on tears and you know what they plan to do with their life and how our communities will be affected and their children. So that's a, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I, I think asking those questions starts a larger conversation. So I, I'd like to thank you for standing up and asking that question. So in recent years, I've seen a lot of articles where people are asking like, why not my neighborhood, right? And uh, one of the most recent ones have been East Bakers, where they're like, oh, the newest store, the newest restaurant on Roseville Highway, why not us? So I, I think it starts with asking those questions very publicly saying, and that holds our elected officials um, accountable, right? So I would say if, if you're definitely interested in getting them uh, more, you know, getting more attention to your neighborhoods, getting them to, to come and, and really invest in them is to go to the city council, the board of supervisors. Recently, the, uh, the city council, uh, they, every 10 years, they do what they call a housing element, which how they support housing, and they open up uh, it for public comment. So one of the things that they did is what they cited in some of our research, and uh, people went and and try to get the the record out. They said that it gives our city an eyesore, that this this history doesn't belong here. And and these are the types of persistence you know that, that these types of reports receive as well, right? So I, I think asking and, and and saying, I would like you to invest in our neighborhoods, come out here, uh, we have a community center, or just come out and look at our houses. Uh, you know, if you're in the city, just say, hey, look, uh, look at our street lights, look at our curbs. I, I think just asking them and inviting them to, to be a part of their conversation about your neighborhoods, I, I think it starts a longer conversation. And, and you know, for them to include it in the uh, housing element is, is good because they acknowledge some of these practices are a long time discriminatory, like you're saying, the lack of investment. And, and we see it when we live there, right? And, and I think asking those questions brings up, um, you know, more answers, right? So do you want to contact? Yeah. We're hoping like this project is going to get these conversations going, and we we are seeing evidence that it is. Uh, you want to share with, uh, with the Bakersfield City Council? Um, you know, cited our website in a meeting. Um, we have it on the video. That, uh, yeah, they, they read a racially restrictive covenant all loud uh, for the record. Yeah. So I we thought that was relatively unique, especially for the City Council. Um, so I, I definitely acknowledge it was uh, Eric Aria, so I, if he ever watches this video, shout out to him. So yeah, th th there, is, there is more answers now. Yes? So something that I find interesting about this is that all of us, I guess, could go and look where we live, see if there was a racial covenant there, and then something that all of us could do is ask for it to be removed where we live. Yes. And I know that sounds symbolic, but I actually think it's important, mm -hmm. right, to say, like, this is something because I think it's wrong. Yeah. And I know that in California, you can apply if you're a student as a senior for 
civic seal, and that would get you a civic seal, mm -hmm. which is like a special mark on your diploma saying that you did something important in your community. Yeah. So, thoughts? So, yeah. like, I'll reinforce that if anybody's interested in, you know, and in, in knows their neighborhood. Uh, I have all the all the uh, restricted covenants, the document numbers from the Hall of Records on a spreadsheet. So it'd be really easy to find and support you in that. Thank you. Any other questions or commentary? I'd like to talk about HOA sometime, but that's me taking you out to dinner. <laughs> 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 so I think that's just like a whole Nazi thing. I really yeah, do. Yeah. But that's a dinner, and that's yeah. a long conversation. I'm trying to remember. There, there's a book on it. If I can remember, I'll send it to you. Okay. Questions or comments? Yes, of course, yes. So there's this website on a Bakersfield website. You could download it. Um, it's an app. So if you're driving down the street, you see a pothole, you could report it. I noticed that if I'm in a better neighborhood, <laughs> they, you know, they, they're easily going to fix it. But if, I, if I'm on, like, near going to Lamont or something, they'll say, oh no, we don't cover that. So I don't know if you guys know. Um, I guess the city owns part of the, the town, but not the whole town, so they yes. only fix so yeah, I didn't know that. There's, there's a place that we, they're called County Islands. Chris um, made me aware of that, and interestingly enough, my, my parents' neighborhood, they're in a county island, and we're like really close to the city. We're like Brundage and A, which is, you know, we're one of the uh, It's very in the city, and we don't have curbs, right? We don't have the sewer, so we also, that's something we reflect on when we're really close to the city, and we say, well, what, why doesn't the city annex us? But also, when the city annexes you and puts you on the sewer, we were just talking about on the way here, it's like $10,000 to hook you up to the sewer. I mean, imagine having a home loan and someone says, $10,000 up front to hook you up to the sewer. I, I, so cities, city enemies are very important, but that is an extremely high cost. Hey, but you're not going to have to pay that 10000 to get that what, septic tank sucked up. Mm -hmm. That's true. Road, yeah. so it's a long-term investment. <laughs> yes. Is there been Oh yeah, that, so one of the things, I, we started to have a conversation about it. I, I, we haven't really started with that. I'm not, I, I would maybe, maybe all of my notes and projects that are doing that. Um, but I, one of the things that you usually see when a neighborhood goes into decline or lack of investment is when they become food deserts, when, when the grocery store leaves and the liquor stores come, you, you see a rapid transformation of urban investment. So I, I think there's a lot of urban and suburban research on those types of uh, changes in a neighborhood. But interestingly enough, I, I'm seeing that like in, it, for those that uh, are no oil deal, like their, their bonds is left, right? So one of the questions is like, what, what will happen to the neighborhood, right? Uh, or, or other neighborhoods that when, they're, when their store leaves, like what is happening to the neighborhood, right? I, I, I've seen like a series of bonds leave like smaller communities as well. Real briefly, uh, Myrna Trancosa Sawyer, she's a professor at, at Northridge. Um, and she's married to Adam Sawyer who directs liberal studies at CSU Bakersfield. But she wrote her dissertation on food deserts in the valley and some of the uh, innovative work like in the Arden Lamont area on um, like community gardening. But she writes broadly about foods, foodscapes in the valley. But they're not, you know, but there a lot of people who write about the valley, they never come to the valley. Like you, you, they know it at UCLA or down in LA, but very seldom do we get to hear this cutting edge research, which makes this presentation like uber important. <laughs> I'll reinforce um, Dr. Rosales' comment. Uh, so I, I did some research in, in my own neighborhood where, my, where I grew up and my parents. Uh, when we first moved there, we were like two or three Hispanic families in the blocks. And, and now it's a, it's, a, it's a very Hispanic community to change during my childhood. And, and you know, our, we had like an alpha beta, if anybody remembers those type of old the grocery, that they left. And then eventually uh, an Albertsons came by. Uh, we had Young's Marketplace. And, um, but the, the, de the demographic in that neighborhood changed dramatically. And uh, doing some research recently, I found out that, it, that the house is older than that covenant period, but those neighborhoods did have covenants. So the question uh, what we look at is like, you know, locally is like, you know, uh, how much has my neighborhood changed, right? Well, what does investment look like now? You know, if I live there, um, what does my city or county support look like? So I think from a local lens, we, we, I tend to think, think about my neighborhood. And I've had com conversations with other educators who say, you know, like, I would have never fit that description. I would have not fit that description. You know, I, I'm Hispanic first generation. So uh, a lot of people that think about those neighborhoods, they think about themselves and I would have not fit that description. And, and what happens when, when I do, right? Okay. Uh, 
And there were cases where you had like black doctors who, who had money and means who couldn't get into white neighborhoods at all. And it wasn't because they wanted to live next to white people. It's because like, oh, that's where the good schools are. That's where all the amenities are. And you know, anyway. It, it, So like for gentrification? Yeah. So gentrification, uh, it, I think it's more of a, like, you know, when neighborhood goes into decline and then they, they reinvest, but also take away affordable housing, right? And for those people that are most likely there when it's a, a neighborhood that's affordable, they may be tenants, they may not be owners, they might not be able to also um, exercise in the, uh, the ability to get generational wealth or equity in those homes. And we're seeing this in this time period as well, where people are renters, people are being moved, and they're not able to get that, that wealth that could get them into the next home or get their children into a home. So uh, gentrification also excludes certain, certain people from participation in, in, in those types of investments. Thank you.